Thanks, Eric. Well, welcome to everyone this morning, uh, those of you here and those of you at home um, watching online. Um, hope you're enjoying uh, what up until this morning was very nice weather that we've been having. Uh, it's a great day, a great time of year if you've got any time at all to get out and enjoy the hills and ravines around here. The golden bean, bean is in full bloom. The Saskatoons are in full bloom. The little things like the moss flocks and the violets are out. So if you get a chance, go out and enjoy the, the nature around you. And as you do, um, we should all acknowledge that we live, work, worship and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsutina, the Yayaxi Nakoda Nations, Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd like to say also welcome to Andrea Parrott. Uh, if you read in the newsletter, Andrea is the director of the Calgary McLeod Cyclical Initiative, um, which helps to uh, develop uh, teams to plant new churches and has done a lot of work in that area. And like also to thank Eric, uh, you'll notice Elizabeth got taller and lost some hair. Uh, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth is uh, off doing other things this week and Eric is standing in for her, so thanks for that, Eric. Want to say thanks to the tiny but mighty team that got together for the outdoor cleanup uh, yesterday. Uh, a lot of work done. We didn't need as many people, fortunately, because the work that was done last year dealt with years of, of uh, catch-up, so it, we got a lot done. I'd like to say a special thanks to Enika, our administrator, who came here as a volunteer, and uh, she raked most of the um, uh, mulch chips that you see there around the tree herself, and uh, also to Jack, who during the week um, came, and I don't know if you noticed coming in, but our shed has been, as some have said, on the congregational questionnaires that we're starting to look at now, an embarrassment. Um, and it looks a lot better now. <laughs> so uh, so uh, thanks for applying the plywood and the paint, and it looks a lot better. If anybody has some shingles in their garage that you want to put on the top of it, that would be the nice next step. So speaking of things in your garage, um, the yard sale's coming up. So um, it's not time to get excited about the day yet, but it is time to start saving your treasures. And you know, um, you, you might want to mention to other people around you that we're having a yard sale, because there's lots of people out there looking for a good place to give their stuff. And um, we've already had a couple of family members um, <laughs> ask us to come over and pick up large quantities of things. So, so it's, a, it's a good thing to do. Remember, um, no clothing, no building supplies, and we aren't allowed to take baby furniture or equipment because of the safety regulations around that. Um, you'll be able to drop it off the week before, um, or if they're large, connect with Richard, um, and we'll arrange for somebody to come and help pick it up. Uh, Celebration Sunday is coming up, so Celebration Sunday is what we do to wrap up uh, Sunday school year. Um, that'll be June the 19th, and we'll have a special service for that. Because of COVID, we haven't been able to have much of a Sunday school for a couple of years, and the kids generally in Westminster, we give a Bible to children who are, are graduating from the grade four year, and we haven't done that for a couple of years. So if you know any kids that have come to Westminster and um, would like to have a Bible given to them that day, if they're in grade four to six, because they will have missed um, a couple of years, uh, just let us know and we'll make sure there's one here for them. This week marked the one-year discovery of the, uh, of the graves at the Kamloops Residential School. And uh, that brings to all of us an awareness that we should be reminding ourselves of the 94 calls to action um, in the uh, commission. And uh, Judy is going to be putting on a couple of evenings on the 21st and the 28th um, to, to uh, give you more awareness of what's going on with that. Um, VBS is coming up August 8th, 12th, fun time for the kids. Um, we've got lots of adults volunteering to coordinate some of the module things, which is great. We could still use a few adults to help out with sort of being the homeroom and ferrying the kids through and, and uh, snacks and some other things. So um, if, if you're interested in helping out, uh, you can let me know, Diane know, Deirdre know, we'll all be working together to make this happen. Um, you'll see Summer Lunch Club is looking for volunteers to help serve lunches and to help clean up the kitchen on, I believe it's the 28th of June, um, before we kick off with that. 
So next week, his special service, it's Pentecost next week. That's, that ends the season of the year that starts with Advent and moves into the long season of about five to six months of, of Pentecost. Um, and uh, it'll be a communion service. So uh, enjoy your week before then, and uh, we will see you next week. Good morning, everyone. Please join with me in the call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Let us uh, begin our worship with our opening hymn for the beauty of the earth. God of glory and majesty, God of mystery and mercy, in Christ Jesus you came among us, sharing in our joys and sorrows. After he suffered and died for our sake, you raised him and took him up in glory so that he might fulfill all things. As our ascended Lord, he gives hope to your people in all places, in every generation and every situation. So we claim that hope this day for ourselves and for the world you love, offering our praise and worship in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, you desire us to live in the unity and be one as you are three in one. Yet we confess that such unity often eludes us. We dwell on our differences and find reasons to criticize each other. This love you called us to offer one another, often one another disappears when we disagree. Forgive us for making our opinions and preferences into dividing lines within the body of your church. Call us again to honor the unity and love you cherish for your followers so we may witness to the unity and love in this divided world. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. 
Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and given a ministry of reconciliation for his sake. Thanks be to God. And with that, I invite Deirdre to come up. If you have any children, you can just come forward. I think we have one at least. <laughs> Okay, Thea, so today we're going to talk about how things can be present even when we don't see them. And it's sort of like this piece of paper. Do you see anything on this paper? This, that, this looks like an old wrinkled piece of paper, doesn't it? Well, we're going to see what happens if we put a little effort into this paper. Still, still on the carpet. <laughs> okay, let's just see what happens. You can leave the word if you want, sweetie, as it comes up. Say, God is all around us. So, yeah, so just like it looked like a blank piece of paper, but it actually had something on it, didn't it? And we just had to apply some effort to see what it said. And God's like that, you know, he, we don't always see him, but he's always present with us. And he sometimes shows up in unexpected places. Can you think of some places that God is in the world? I'm sorry, he's on earth. He's on earth, that's right. And what, what about when people are kind? Is God there when people are kind? Yeah. Is somebody kind to you this week? Or were you kind to someone? And what about when people are helping each other? Is God there then? Yeah, say he's there then. And what about when people are sad or lonely or scared? Yes, he's especially there then. So we, we see God is just like this piece of paper that looked blank but had something there. God is always around us, and we have to sometimes just pay attention and look for him. So we're just going to say a little prayer before Sunday school. Now if you could repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for always being with us. Even when, we can't see you. Even when we can't see you. Help us to learn to look for you. So that we can join with you. In making the world. A better place. Amen. You can go to Sunday school now. Continue with our next hymn, 461, One More Step Around the World I Go. i 
May God open our, our, our minds and hearts to the reading from his holy word. Uh, the first reading is from Psalm 97, and I, um, I believe it's going to be responsive. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. The darkness are all around you. Righteous and redemptive. Fire goes before him and consumes his adversaries on every side. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. All worshippers of images are put to shame. Those who make their boast in worthless idols, all gods bow down before him. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Like dawns for the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. The second scripture reading is from the New Testament, Ephesians 1, uh, 15, verses 15 to 23, and you can find it on page 192 of the Pew Bible. It's Paul's prayer to the early church. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly pain. Places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Thanks be to God. For this reading from his holy word.
Thank you for that reading, Judy. And thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be in the flesh here. Um, I have been working for Calgary McLeod for about three years now. Uh, as Heather said, uh, working with leaders and people in our congregations who are interested in starting new things. So we're trying to get away from thinking of church plants of you have one leader and they gather people and they buy a building with a piece of land and move more towards uh, what's already happening in our communities and how do we as the church join in with the work that's going on. So that's just the briefest intro to who I am and uh, the work that I've been doing, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So uh, with that, let's pray. God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts here in this room and online be acceptable to you this day, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So I'm glad that Heather mentioned Pentecost is coming up because today we're talking about the church, litur the liturgical church year. Uh, does anyone know what today is in the calendar? Yeah, I heard a murmur, Ascension Sunday. So if you want to be a peak church nerd like some of my Anglican colleagues, you'll call it Ascension Tide. Um, the season of ascension, but today we're just going to call it whatever we want, and today is the day that we are celebrating when Christ ascended into heaven. The church liturgical year has been journeying through this past winter and spring towards Pentecost, which we celebrate next week. We started back with Advent, waiting for Jesus' arrival. We've journeyed through Lent, and now we're in these seven weeks of Easter where we have been sitting with Jesus, grappling with the resurrection, and wondering about God's power over death. In this time between Easter and Pentecost, we ponder what it might have meant for those first disciples witnessing this. And we ponder what it means for us today as disciples. When Jesus left the earth in what we call the ascension, our understanding of discipleship, of being a follower of Christ, changed. In the book of Matthew, the disciples are left with the great commission to go about making more disciples on their way. In the book of Acts, which is Luke's account, we hear about two angels in white robes who promise that the disciples will receive the Holy Spirit. These passages empower our church then and today and give us our mission here on earth. Today, the passage that Judy read was not a gospel account of the Ascension or from the Acts of the Apostles, but it was Ephesians, one of Paul's letters. And it's almost this little offhanded comment in this section in the introduction to Ephesians. Paul hadn't been personally witnessed the Ascension but it is such a powerful moment in his own discipleship that he's using it to impart wisdom and explain things to the church plants that he had across the Mediterranean. And what a lovely explanation it is. For Paul, the meaning of the ascension takes on a doxology, a thanksgiving to God, which is reminiscent of the Psalms and even the Psalm we heard today these sweeping powers about God's greatness and power and glory. Now, normally in a sermon, I would now insert a story about the wonder and glory of God's reign and Jesus' reign here on earth. And perhaps I'll get to that later in the sermon. But for today, after the week I've had, perhaps after the week you've had, I'm finding it difficult to wrap my mind around Lord of all power. How do we declare that Jesus has triumphed over death when this week 19 children so needlessly died? Last week there was a deadly shooting in a Taiwanese church and the week before 10 people were murdered in a supermarket. How do we talk about this incomparably great power when war is going on in Ukraine and Ethiopia and Yemen, and it goes on. How 
do we talk about this power, which is not only present in that age, but in the ages to come, when we are marking the first anniversary since the graves of the 215 children at Kamloops Indian Residential School were confirmed? These opposing realities of God's glory and Christ's reign on earth with the reality in our lives and in the news, it pokes holes in our own fragility. It pokes holes in my fragility. It reminds us of our fragile existence and honestly, how fragile our faith can be at times. It makes us look out at the world and question how are we, the gathered body of God, the visible body of Christ, how are we to be witnesses to the world, witnesses to God's reconciling love, when at times we might be unsure about it ourselves? So, I'll take the Apostle Paul's advice and pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I, uh, some of the work that I do with a board uh, out of Atlanta, I came across a wonderful scholar and uh, wisdom keeper, Dr. Elizabeth Conde Frazier. She's a Latina scholar from the United States. She's from an immigrant family and now is an elder within her community and deeply invested in supporting and encouraging those around her. And there's a story that she shares to support people and encourage them. So I'm gonna share it now. Elizabeth says, my grandmother always knew that God could hear her. She had arthritis and the pain would keep her up at night so she would use that time to pray for others to be healed. And they were. But when Elizabeth's mother got sick and her grandmother went and prayed to God, Elizabeth says, when my grandmother asked God to heal her daughter's cancer, like God had done with so many others that she had prayed for, my grandmother told us God would not come to her door. She had fought with God all night. And in the morning, Elizabeth's grandmother gathered her family around and through pursed lips announced, God does not come to heal my daughter. Understandably, the family broke down. This was devastating news. But her grandmother continued, while God will take her, God promised me that he will take care of us in the moment and in the days to come. We will know sorrow, but we will also know accompaniment. And with that, Elizabeth's grandmother started to sing a song in Spanish. Why should I be discouraged? Now Elizabeth says this of her grandmother. That, that was her faith. Standing there singing a song after a night of pleading with God to save her daughter. Her lament had turned into worship. In the depths of our crisis, when we feel most fragile, when we turn to worship, we find God. When we are unsure of how to make sense of Jesus having incomparable power in our broken world, we turn to worship we go back to the familiar. Now, I have a small confession. I have to say, going back to the familiar is exactly the opposite of what I said in my sermon last week. Not that, any would, uh, would, not that any one of you would know, but I still feel I just need to confess that in case you come across it. <laughs> They're all on YouTube now. I said last week that we shouldn't go back to the familiar when we're taking risks and trying to follow Jesus. However, I want to make an amendment to that statement. Going back to the familiar through an act of worship, that is worth doing. That's the reason why some of our traditions, our way of worship has lasted 2,000 years. Worship recalibrates us and reminds us of God's radical love and hospitality. Elizabeth's grandmother knew this. Worship and witness are intertwined. When we gather together, 
we are reminded of the transcendence of God, the otherness of the divine. When we worship, we are reconnected with Yahweh, the unnameable I am who I am. When we worship, we both remember and realize that God is beyond our comprehension. And through the Spirit, we seek wisdom and revelation. Now, even though God is wholly other and we cannot conceive the totality of God, our God is a God who has taken a risk. God has taken a risk in love to reveal himself to humans. And in turn, we fumble our way forward into knowing God just a little bit more. God takes the risk of revealing himself through Jesus where the powers of the cosmos are packaged into this tiny, fragile human form. And through the resurrection and ascension, this incarnation of the divine power stays with us in the church. So this past week, I was attending an online conference. Now, I've done, done like one-day workshops and stuff, but this was my first online conference where I was online and Almost everyone else was in the room. It was okay. I survived. But there was a wonderful speaker who, uh, even for people in the room and online, had us glued to our screens. Andy Root is an American scholar. And he uh, was taking about six hours to share with us about the church and the crisis of decline. I think most churches know about the crisis of decline. But Andy got to a point in his uh, speech, in his workshop, where he was asking, do we really talk about God in church? And that's kind of where his research was taking him. He would ask people in congregations, how do you know God? How have you encountered Jesus? Incarnation to be the fancy word that we use when you're but when you aren't in the pulpit or writing a paper, we just say, how have you encountered Jesus? And he asks, have you shared that with others who are in the pews with you? Do they know that story? The answer is often they don't. But Andy shared one story uh, this week that has really stuck with me, and it was this story about a busy single mother. She was always on the go, getting things done, powerhouse in the church. But he had a moment where he asked her, how do you know Jesus? When did you encounter God? When did you know that God was who God is? And so she shared this story with him. She shared how about 10 years before, it was a regular weekday, and she had kissed her husband goodbye, he was off on a trip across the country. But 12 hours later, she woke up to the phone call that no one wants to get. There was a stammering voice on the other end saying, you know, we're at this conference, we were with your husband last night, and, and I don't even know how to say this, but your husband is dead. She says it's a blur. She doesn't know how she got through the next 12 hours, the next 12 days, but she had things arranged and she took her flight across the country. It could have been a 15-minute flight. It could have been a 15-hour flight. She didn't know. When she got to the airport, you, know, you stand in the long line of the queue for a cab, and she just kind of mumbled and fumbled her way into the cab and gave the address of where she was going to claim the body. She tried to hold it together. She was sitting in the back of the cab. And she said, on later reflection, I really should have known. She should have clued in that the cab, it didn't just kind of hover in the lane and put the flashers on and get you to pay and kick you out, but it parked and it stayed. But she didn't know that. She paid and she went inside the morgue. And then she had to do the hardest thing she had ever had to do. And as she was taken back, the body on the gurney did indeed reveal to be her husband's. And she could not hold it together. In that moment, as she was breaking down, a hand reached around her to steady her. And the other hand was holding a bottle of water and some Kleenex. 
It was her cab driver. He'd say, oh, I should have known I couldn't do this story. The cab driver had stopped and he accompanied her, knowing that whatever lied on the other side of the door, she was about to face the impossible. So in that moment, that was the moment where she knew Jesus was with her. She knew that God would see her through it. And that is the power. That is the love that crosses time and space. That is what's being talked about in this passage that Judy read today. You know what makes the ascension so powerful? It's not just because the all-powerful Christ now resides at the right hand of God. That's wonderful. But what makes it so powerful is that the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that is the same power which resides in the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the church, here today in this world. That power of love remains with us and for the time to come. And that love, that is what we share with others when we reach out to our friends and our neighbors and our enemies. And this is the power that we are witnessing to through our worship and our actions. Our God is a God who takes risks. God takes the risk not just to reveal himself through Jesus, but takes the risk that even without Jesus, physically here on earth, the church, the visible body of Christ, who receives the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, God takes the risk that we will continue to join in with God in the work in the world of witnessing to this powerful love. Even in this fallen, broken world, in this fallen, broken church, we might be able to witness to God's love through how we gather, through how we interact with one another, through how we love our neighbors, and yes, even how we love our enemies. That others in the world might then be witness to God's love. I have one more story, and I won't cry in this one. This is about Garden City Church in Southern California. It's a church plant story. I couldn't get away without doing one church plant story. There, they are an outdoor church. They're in Southern California. They can get away with it with their weather. It's in a small seaside town where they have in that downtown area one of those abandoned plots where it's between the buildings and there's nothing there. And so they planted a garden. So they literally planted a church in this plot. In this community, people with means and livelihoods lived up in the hills. And the industrial workers, the immigrants, and the marginalized folks lived down closer to the water. And the downtown is where they crossed over, but only with those in the hills who would come down to go have dinner at the fancier restaurants and then escape back up. The minister who started Garden City Church, she said she had this image of being the gathered body of Christ where everyone, those up in the hills and those down by the water, were present around the table together. Their church gathering is simple. They start by gardening together, a work party like you had, tending to the plots that they have put in. They then have a communion worship service, and then they have a meal where they sit together and break bread. Now, to start with, the majority of the people who came to help with the garden were those who lived up in the hills. And those who came there for the meal were those who lived down by the water. The people who had means felt like they were doing something good for the city. They were gardening, they were helping to beautify this area of their city. And those who were in a need of a meal, in real need of food, would wander in just in time to eat. But as they kept going, as they were being the church together, the worship service that was kind of plunked in the middle, people started to linger. They stayed later after gardening, or they arrived a bit earlier for the meal to worship. And then after some time, 
those who were gardening began to stay for the meal as well. And those who were coming for the meal helped in the garden. They were truly mixing with one another, sharing in conversation, sharing in lives, and becoming part of that minister's vision of being the body of Christ, all present, gathered at the table. And they were joined together by worship and witness. So for us today, this is the call for us on this Ascension Sunday. How our discipleship, discipleship shifts and changes. How we collectively discover the Holy Trinity who is above rule and authority and power and dominion. And we find that the Spirit is in us and among us and within us as the body of Christ. So in this Ascension Tide, as we lead up to Pentecost, this is the time where we are rediscovering what it means to be a disciple. And that is our calling as the gathered body of Christ. So may you here in person, may you online, may you watching this later in the week, may you journey knowing that within you and within this congregation lies that same power of resurrection. And this is the love to which we are witness to and share with others. May it be so. Amen. At this time for the offering, I'd like to remind you that we're, uh, you're practicing uh, offering on the way out, um, or there's many ways online to donate, um, but all these gifts are good, and we give thanks to God for these blessings and present our offerings in the way that we can. Let us pray together. Um, and when you hear the words, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we give you thanks for your steadfast love that provides courage and comfort to your people in every challenging time. Continue to surprise us with your grace, O oh God, and breathe your spirit upon your church once more. Draw us together in worship and witness. And renew our faith so that we may serve you with courage and creativity. 
offering the hope we know in Christ Jesus to this struggling world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, thank you for sending Jesus into the world to reconcile the world to you through the forgiveness of our sins. May the fruits of the reconciliation and peace he offers continue to work in the places of hatred and hostility. Today we name places of hatred and hostility, Ukraine, Yemen, Ethiopia, and places much closer to home in our communities where unspeakable violence and hatred live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, do not let us be resigned to injustice or indifference. Inspire us to build renewed relationships in these days of deepening divisions. God of fellowship, we pray for our church and our community. Renew our life together as we gather again socially as the pandemic shifts around us. Inspire this congregation with a fresh vision for our ministry. Comfort those who mourn the loss of dear ones. Support those who are sick and those recovering from setbacks or failure. Give strength to people who are worn out or discouraged and calm the anxiety or anger that can keep us apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who calls us into our future, we pray for students who will be graduating this year, filled with anticipation and uncertainty about the future. Guide their choices. We remember the graduates from our theological colleges. May they always remember that you called them into ministry and that you will provide them with the wisdom, strength, and grace needed to live out their ever-changing context. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, by your spirit, fill us with the faith and courage to do the work Jesus commissioned his followers to undertake wherever he leads. For we are bold to pray together the words he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. For our closing hymn, it is number 574 with the Lord as my guide.
Well, it has been a pleasure to worship with you today. And may you go out from here knowing that even in the most broken of places, God's love is still there. And that power of the resurrection is the same power that resides in our gathered body of Christ, the church. So may you go out from here able to witness and worship to that fact. Go now with the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.